is in the Arapaho National Forest area in Colorado. It was established in 1908 by Theodore Roosevelt. And among how many parks did he do? Like a lot of them. most of them, pretty much. Yeah, he uh, he's like one of our favorite presidents, and uh, he established a ton of parks, national forests. Um, really, is the father of the national park system. Yep, that's 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 why I like him. Yeah, and he's crazy, which was great too. We've <laughs> talked about this in other episodes. But. Yeah. So the park is 2,928 square kilometers, so it's slightly larger than the state of Delaware. So it's a big. Well, it's a forest. Area. Yeah. National Forest. I keep saying park, don't I? Yeah. Whatever. So (laughs) Pendleton Mountain checks in at 12,902 feet, but there are several other 12,000-foot mountains in the forest, including Gray's Peak, Peak, Mount Evans, Bard Peak, and Pettingle Peak, uh, just to name a few. So the name Arapaho is derived from the Arapaho Native Americans that inhabited, uh, inhabited the plains of Colorado and Wyoming. As of 2010... The Arapaho tribe had a population of 10,861. So Arapaho can trace their ancestors back over 3,000 years where they lived uh, where they lived in present-day Manitoba, Canada, and Minnesota. So they're more northern region. Mm-hmm. Sometime before the 1700s, the Arapaho moved into the west, uh, western Great Lakes and Great Plains. So Rocky Mountain is one of the nation's highest national parks, with elevations from 7,860 feet to 14,259 feet. So I we're, I know we're talking about the Arapaho National Forest, but some of the facts here are from Rocky Mountain National Park just because it's just north of Arapaho National Forest. Okay, so it's just like the same area. So a lot of the same terrain and weather and everything you experience in Rocky Mountain National Park you would experience in the forest. All right, perfect. Uh, let's see. The Rocky Mountain has an extensive museum collection. Rocky Mountains Museum Collection preserves artifacts and specimens that tell the story of the park. In total, the collection includes 33,400 cultural objects, 294 works of art, and 10,495 biological specimens and 455 geological specimens. And I know, um, is it Aspen, where they have, like, a big dinosaur exhibit? Because they're, like, constantly finding a ton of fossils and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. but Every uh, time they want to develop, they keep finding more stuff and... This would, museum sounds really cool. If I'm ever in the area, I'm definitely going to go to it. Yeah, there's a couple. In each little town, they typically have some sort of thing around mm-hmm. geological stuff that they're doing. So the Rocky Mountain Divide and North American continent rivers on the west side of the Rocky Mountains flow to the Pacific Ocean, while the rivers on the east side flow into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the Rocky Mountains are 80 million to 55 million years old. So, Yeah, it's interesting about the rivers. I don't think a lot of people realize the continental divide is named that because it's literally the the center point of the continent and it's interesting to think that the water if you're standing on that line water flows both directions so so. going off that theme (laughs) i read i read a reddit story of a guy who wanted to climb there's a mountain that the peak where like the west side is on that side east side's on that side and the south side goes there and he's like i'm gonna climb that and do my business so that my hearing (laughs) will go and i can pee he said he wants to pee in three oceans at once oh boy so (laughs) i i kind of want to do that too it's such a guy thing yeah so the climate uh just being in mountainous uh and if you're from colorado you already know this it's alpine climate so you get warmer weather in the valleys cold at elevation even during the summer and that's where uh when I climbed uh, Keyhole, mm-hmm. at, uh, I forgot what peak it's called. I forgot. I was in Boulder Field, but there was some guy that started hiking at the base, and we camped in Boulder Field. Yeah. And by the time he made it up, he said it was like 70s in the parking lot, and we had a blizzard up top. So it, it can range wildly. Yeah, even, and it does isn't just Colorado. It's kind of the whole Rockies. I experienced that when I was hiking in the Canadian Rockies. It was sunny and warm down in the valley, and as we went up to elevation, it got it got colder, it rained, and then eventually ended with snow. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you experience all four seasons. When yeah, you're there. and we had lightning <clears throat> that trip too. So we literally experienced every form of weather in <laughs> the same area over the week, except monsoon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank God. So uh, we'll jump to exposure. So the extreme risk of exposure starting at nine thousand feet. That's where you start losing trees and other things at in that specific spot. Uh, it differs in different mountain areas. Sometimes it's ten, eleven thousand feet. Sometimes it's it's lower. Uh, Even in summer, as we said, it can get very cold at elevation. At the time of this recording, current forecast at 12,000 feet was in the low 40s to mid-50s, and the lows in the upper 20s. 
So that's at night. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so it's cold up there. Yeah, I added that into the research just because um, it's really interesting. You know, it's June. It's the West Coast is going through a tremendous uh, heat wave, and you know, it's usually warm and humid. But at elevation, I mean, it's it's in the upper twenties still right now, and they had rain and snow and lightning in the forecast for the next twelve <laughs> days. So if you're hiking in an alpine climate, uh, these are all things you definitely anyone who goes hiking in the mountains checks the weather uh, every, you know, probably every day if they're doing day hikes or if you're leaving for a multi-hike, multi-day hike, you're going to check the long-range forecast for the next week because um, you need to know what you're going to experience. <laughs> yeah, I've been stuck in lightning storms at altitude, and it's just, it's bad. I know we, we like, huddled it under a big boulder because you're the highest object. If you're near a peak, that it will hit the peak, but other than that... Yeah, and it's dangerous. A, a, just a, a, a quick thing, too, about the elevations, and these kind of things change um, depending on where you are in the country or world based on moisture levels. But, you know, in the Rockies in this area, in the 5,000-foot range, you're going to have, you know, short grass prairies. Um, from 6,000 to 9,000 feet, you're going to have montane environment, which I actually had to look this up because I've never heard that term before. So montane is the growth zone of relatively cool upland slopes below the timber line, and it's usually dominated by large, uh, you know, looks large pine trees that you see. Oh, okay. And then, you know, from your 9,000 to 11,200 feet, that's your subalpine. So starting about 9,000 feet in this park, you're not going to have any shelter from exposure. And, a, you know, subalpine, there's still shrubs and stuff growing, sure. but once you hit 11,000 feet, you're in the alpine tundra zone, and that is where pretty much nothing is growing. So yeah, you're it. In the lightning storm, you're 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 it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you hear if you're hiking up a mountain and you hear lightning even off in the distance, turn around. Yeah, it's not worth it. That's, why, that's why you go early in the morning too. Most storms hit mountains in the afternoon. Yeah, you definitely do not want to get <clears throat> stuck on a twelve thousand foot peak in a lightning storm because you now are the tallest object on yeah. that mountain, even if you're you know, in the fetal position. <laughs> so I can't confirm this, but I've always heard that lightning is the thing that kills people the most in the mountains. I've always heard that that's the fit. Like people always worry about falling or injury like that. It's usually if you're up there stuck in a storm, that's like the most dangerous outside of getting wet and hypothermia and all those other things. It's, it's being struck by lightning at altitude. Cause you, you're just I think, done. I think the danger with lightning is it's the, the thing that you can't prepare for. It's not like you can bring clothing. that will protect you from lightning. I mean, you know, if it's really cold, you bring warm weather. You know, if it's rainy, you bring rain gear. But lightning, nothing is going to protect you. There's no shelter. Oh, you have a full metal suit. That's, it was <laughs> yeah. a Mythbusters, though. Oh, really? um, <laughs> yes, it was. They talked about knights. If a knight with all the armor on, yeah. lightning doesn't penetrate it. It goes on the outside. So if you're wearing a full metal suit grounded, you'll be fine. That's funny. So you can lug a 200-pound metal chainmail suit up there, and you'll be just fine. <laughs> All right, so moving on. Um, at almost 13,000 feet is where altitude sickness be can become a really uh, big issue, So, especially for anyone who isn't acclimated or out of shape. So if you come uh, from out of state or something like that, you have to get used to the altitude first before you start going in there. So according to the Cleveland Clinic, over 75% of people over 10,000 feet will experience some form of AMS or acute mount, mountain sickness. This is altitude sickness. Yeah, this is um, an interesting stat that I, I found when I was researching this episode because we always talk about altitude sickness, but I've experienced it. Um, probably everyone that's hiked in the mountains has experienced it, it, in some mild, form. mild forms of it. And it usually goes away after a few days, but um, as Joe will say here in a few minutes, you know, as he goes on here, it can get serious yeah. where you have to turn back. Yeah, we had a guy, uh, when we were doing Kilimanjaro, he died on the summit from acute mountain sickness. He was an older gentleman, but it was clear he wasn't fully acclimated, and he just went downhill real fast, and the only way to combat it, besides some over-the-counter painkillers and stuff, is to just de-altitude, go down. As yeah, fast the problem as you can. the problem you get if you have severe symptoms is edema, and yep. that's basically lungs in your your or fluid in your lungs, or your brain, and the only way to cure that, you're, it's a race against time, and you got to get below four thousand feet and then to a hospital immediately, yep. or you will die from that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's su it's it's rare, but it it can happen, and you just got to be aware of the the signs and symptoms. Yeah, watch any of those shows on the Discovery Channel about the people that hike Mount Everest. It happens every year yeah. on Everest. Yeah, because so. they're at extreme altitudes. <laughs> yeah. So difficulty in general, uh, 
same as we said in other episodes, anytime you're in a mountain summit that goes above 8,000 feet, the level of difficulty just increases. Even if there's no climbing, it's just the physical attributes of being at altitude. So mm-hmm. you, lack of shelter, uh, if you don't have the right stuff to clean your water, because staying hydrated is absolutely key in the mm-hmm. mountains. Uh, when it's cold, sometimes people don't feel like they're thirsty. It's you got to drink water. That's yeah. like the best thing you can do. Um, and uh, many of the summits do include some sort of technical hiking. So it's like narrow paths, loose rock, uh, poorly marked trails. You can get lost. I, uh, I, I coined the phrase. I didn't coin it, but I, they call it the, I call it the final mile. Yeah. It, Cause it's like five miles. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's like five miles and it's always the most hairy of, you know, of the, the trail up, at least in my experience, I've always experienced the really narrow paths where you're looking down at like a thousand foot drop yeah. or, <laughs> or you're on like some really loose scree that if you lose your footing, you're just going to go rolling over the mountain. So like angels landing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hang out on the side of chains and yeah. And the trails aren't really marked well at that point. You'll see maybe like a little disturbed ground from where people have walked, but there's not going to be like a sign with an arrow pointing like summit. I mean, at that elevation. <laughs> yeah, usually it's uh, Karens and like not the kind that people leave in rivers that are annoying, the kind that are used to actually mark mountain trails because there's no grass that you can beat down. So and you'll see big rock Karens form so people can find their way. And one of the issues too is crowding of the trails. Um, I've experienced this in Hawaii on uh, the Kalalau Trail. Um, we were going to do Half Dome, but we didn't have the amount of, we didn't have time to do it. And Half Dome has... Uh, the chains that go up and that gets super crowded. Yeah. People have died on there just slipping off the chain, slipping, being caught up there in lightning storm. Uh, so that's why whenever we hike, we usually get up before, you know, morning yeah. and start hiking in the dark. Cause uh, the, the quicker you can get out there on the trail, the, you're going to avoid a lot of the crowd. Yeah. Before tourist time. <laughs> yeah. But, so uh, that, that pretty much sums up park, <clears throat> any type of risk. Has- 